Welcome everybody to the Miked Up Podcast. Guys, this is episode number two. two. Numero dos. Numero Still dos. Second attempt as well. As well. Yeah. Second attempt at that, but we won't talk about that right now, right? <laughs> well, let's talk about it right now. So, <laughs> Okay, so what are we talking about? First of all, I got fired. I got kicked off the podcast. Uh-huh. I'm just kidding. I just wasn't on this episode. Then you guys recorded it. Had no audio. No audio. So here we are again. So here we are again because Pastor Zach was the participant before. Couldn't be here, so now you're here. Correct. Must have been divine providence. Maybe or maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. (laughs) Anyway, thanks for joining us for the podcast. Episode number two, just a way for us to continue the conversations that we're having around what our current series is called Sunday School. And uh, so take a minute, like the podcast, uh, also subscribe to it. And uh, share it with your friends. If you get something out of it, maybe it would be a blessing to them. Really, we've designed this for the people of Life Church, but know that other people might actually uh, get some stuff out of it as well, right? Yeah. So who knows? Who knows? God can do with it what he wants to do with it. Uh, so let's talk about the Old Testament. That's what we did Sunday. I think we had, a, we had a miracle. Like I overviewed the whole Old Testament in just barely over 30 minutes. Good job. Pretty miraculous. We had a lot of doubters, including probably at least one in this room. Congratulations from my son, right? Yeah, thanks. So um, <laughs> let's talk about the Old Testament for a minute, but here's what I thought we could talk about first. Tell me a little bit uh, about your experience reading the Old Testament. The reason I'm asking that, I kind of started off the whole message. How many of you like reading the Old Testament? What was the percentage of people that raised their hands in the room if you turned around and looked? I didn't turn around and look, but I'm pretty sure it was probably low. It was very low. Yeah. Me I- and Alvin raised our hand, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I enjoy reading the Old Testament. Parts of it, most of it. There's parts of it. I like, enjoy most of it. Most yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but tell me about your journey of learning to read the Old Testament. Was it easy at first? No, I think there was uh, a lot of challenges. And uh, I, looking back, I think there was a lot of things that uh, I wish I would have read it differently than I did earlier on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So tell me more about that. Uh, one thing that I I think I realize now I used to do a lot more and probably still tend to do uh, being an American and an Enneagram 3. If you don't know, if you're not familiar with the Enneagram, we like Enneagram 3 likes to be the hero. Right? And Demonic. we may have just lost some of our audience. When you <laughs> Demonic. <mentioned> Enneagram. <laughs> uh, so uh, I would tend to read myself into the story as the hero. So I'm reading the story of David and uh, I'm trying to figure out how I'm David and uh, not that there's not things we can learn from those characters, right? There's obviously incredible things, but um, ultimately each story points us to uh, the failures of those people and how they fell short and how there's a truer and better hero that was on the way, Jesus. And so when I began to stop reading so narcissistically, I was able to pull out a whole lot more revelation that really built up my faith. That's good. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think... Um First of all, I tried to read the Bible, like, you know, the church would do the Bible plans in a year. Read and, through in one year. Yeah, you and can I would do it. Yeah. I would try to do it, and I'd get lost in, like, Leviticus instantly. It just didn't make sense to me. So, I, first of all, I think it opened up more once I started. Um, well, well, I went through life school ministry, and we did the Old Testament survey. So, everything started to make a little more sense. It was more context. Mm-hmm. Like, just going through all that stuff started making more sense, all the laws and the weird stuff. Sure. Um. But then I think uh, like three years ago, I read the whole Bible in 30 days, which actually it was really hard. But reading even the Old Testament specifically in that short of time makes the story make more sense because you're reading it like really fast and you're getting the whole story rather than it taking six months to get the whole story. And so you just see it in a different way, and it like illuminates different things to you, and just makes it more exciting. You've done that a couple times, right? Read through the whole yeah. Bible in thirty days. Yeah, I think the plan's called Shred, right? Yeah, yeah, Shred. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, for me as well, uh, I can identify with that, especially early on. Even though I probably read the Old Testament, I think I said something conservatively, thirty times, twenty-five to thirty for sure. Uh, I. You know, early on, it was challenging. And, and like, you, you'd get to Leviticus, and it's like, can I just speed read this? Numbers, you know, especially you get to the genealogy, like, what in the world? And even you get to the prophets, right? And you get to Isaiah, Jeremiah, you get to Ezekiel. And they all start off good, right? But then it's like, okay, who is he talking to? Is he talking to God's people here? Is he, mm-hmm. is he prophesying against uh, God's, uh, Israel's enemies? 
what's going on? Just trying to keep it straight was a challenge. And then forget Job, right? Like that just messes up every like idea we have about God. Uh, and so um, it took a while. And, and, and kind of like you, you get Old Testament survey in Bible school. But the average believer doesn't get Old Testament survey, right? So, so how do they learn to read the Bible, especially the Old Testament? I mean, I made a bold statement on Sunday that you'll never really understand the fullness of the New Testament without a proper understanding of the Old Testament, right? Because mm-hmm. the New Testament is all built on what's revealed in the Old Testament. Right. So uh, let's talk about what are some tools that... that um, that we can give the, the people that are listening. They want to under. They want to get through it. They want to read it. They know it's important, right? It's God revealing Himself. Jesus revealed in every book, like I said on Sunday. But uh, what are some tools that they can they can grab onto to help them understand? What are some tools you use, maybe? You want to answer that first? You got it. Um, <clears throat> there's a couple resources that I really like. One of them, uh, there's I read a number of commentaries, but one of my baseline commentaries is the New Bible Commentary, which was recommended to me by somebody else. Um, really solid. It gives you... Wait a second. Let's find out if that's legit or not. Who recommended the new Bible commentary to you? <laughs> Nathan Finocchio. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, it'll give you the, everything you need to know, the, the who, what, when, where about every Bible, but then it also goes through verse by verse and gives you like the highlights, the concepts, yeah. different views on it. It um, gives you good context without also like assigning meaning to everything. You yeah, know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, Mm-hmm. So it's not, it's not yeah, not tr- necessarily trying to tell you how to read it. Right. It's just giving you the who, what, when, where, Correct. that kind of stuff. And then I also really like the uh, Baker's Encyclopedia of the Bible. So you look up any name, uh, any place, anything that's in the Bible, and it's in there, and it's going to tell you everything about it. Uh, so lots of scholars have put tons of work into this, mm-hmm. and uh, it's a tremendous resource that just helps you get a lot more facts about it. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah. You got any suggestions? Yeah. No, not really. Those are exactly what I use. But then I would say also like just keep reading the whole Old Testament as a whole because a lot of times it gives you context within it. Like there's other times in um, the Old Testament where if you just keep reading, it explains itself. Or, Mm -hmm. you know, if you know Genesis, it opens up the other books a lot better so sometimes yeah. within itself it reveals the context yeah and matter, history. Of, matter of fact the number one rule about interpreting scripture is this scripture interprets scripture yeah mm-hmm. right so just reading it all helps understand help, yeah. help, helps to give more context i should say right mm-hmm. yeah. yeah i was gonna say i think that one of the ma- major challenges we can experience is like we get so lost in one particular story and that's good it's good to dive into that but it it's also good to keep it in context of the whole story. And like you're pointing right. out, you're going to see themes that are developed throughout the story because it is one mm-hmm. large story. One story yeah, that right. contains many stories. Right. So many times we like to separate them, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's all, every, con- every story has to be kept in context of the whole story. For instance, why does the story of David and Bathsheba show up? Like, do we just want to hear about David's failure? Right. right. Why does Bathsheba show up in Scripture at all? Like, why didn't God just hide that? Well, as the story unfolds, Jesus comes in the line of David, actually the line of Solomon, who was a son born to Bathsheba, mm-hmm. right? Born in adultery. Born, uh, yeah, well, actually th- that one died. It was oh, after yeah, adultery. That's, that's yeah, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> let's, let's keep it straight here. Ah, so. Thank you. <laughs> or we're going to get called on the carpet by whoever <laughs> pays attention to this. Anyway, so uh, the stories show up for a reason. Even mm-hmm. ones, uh, there, honestly, there's still some. I'm like, okay, why did that show up? I'm still digging in, but I know it's there for a reason. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it's going to show up for a reason. Yeah. So, yeah, I think commentaries can be great. Commentaries could, if you're not careful, also uh, cause confusion. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, Commentaries are somebody's comments about the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, a lot of them are written by theologians, trusted people. Uh, and even so, uh, the best well intentioned theologian, the best well intentioned teacher, we're going to teach, we're going to comment on scripture from our bent and from our mm-hmm. persuasion. Mm-hmm. So, um, <clears throat> just because it's in a commentary doesn't mean it's accurate. Which makes it challenging. Remember, we are reading and interpreting an ancient book. That is really the revelation of God, right? So, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of tools out there. And here's what I like to say. Um, ask your pastor. Like, there might be people watching. I'm not their pastor. 
don't take my word for it. God's placed you in a church. He's given somebody to, to uh, explain the Word of God to you. Find out what they use. Go and find out from them, right? Stay locked in to the, the doctrine that is being laid in the church that God has set you in. Mm-hmm. I'm a, uh, if, if people start tuning in this podcast, what they're going to hear is I am a huge proponent of the local church and that God places you there for a reason uh, so that the doctrine of your life is built by somebody that you can actually watch and see how that doctrine and what it's producing in their lives. Yeah. Uh, there's so many resources out there, right? Google a thing. You can find out a plethora of information. So many teachers teaching on any given subject, uh, be it weird subjects that come up like the Nephilim that show up in Genesis and what's that all about, uh, you know, all the way through any anything. And teachers out there are going to get their persuasion don't just go with what looks good for you, right? Find somebody you know and trust mm-hmm. and uh, let them ask them questions, right? Because that's another thing. I know when we first did this podcast, uh, Pastor Zach was sitting where you are, and uh, he said one of the greatest things he has is the ability to ask questions, mm-hmm. right? So in, in addition to all the tools, you find somebody that can help you interpret, understand. And people ask me questions, and sometimes I just look at them and say, hmm, I don't know. I don't know. I even have people I ask questions of, right? I got my, I've got my dad, uh, the, the, the famous Dr. D. I'll ask him questions. Just two nights ago, we were sitting at dinner, and there was a scriptural topic. Caleb, you were there, and, and uh, I said, hey, tell me what your thoughts are about this. I'm going to say what it is because it could be pretty divisive, <laughs> and I don't want to cause a problem here today. But uh, he thought about it for a minute, and he, he first said, well, what do you think? And I told him what I thought, so he... He processed it, kind of conversation changed. All of a sudden, he came back. He goes, you know what? I agree with you, and here's why. And he gave me his reasons. I go, all right, well, at least I'm not going crazy here. I, that's what I think. So asking people that you trust. I got friends that are in ministry. I'll ask them as well. So I think that's a great way to help you understand the Bible. The reality is God wants it. It's, it's, is it challenging? Yes, it can be. Uh, parts of it are because it's a huge story. It's the unfolding of redemption. Mm -hmm. unfolding of Jesus to us, but it's meant for us to be grasped, to to, to Mm -hmm. understood, Mm -hmm. and to be uh, received by faith. I've found that the understanding begins with the receiving by faith, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, by faith we understand. (laughs) We can't have proper understanding apart from faith, and yet God still has given us minds, and he wants our minds to be able to be wrapped around his truth and his word while some of it hangs in mystery and tension. I know that's kind of a big discussion, but yeah. So the Old Testament can be challenging and can be very enlightening, Mm -hmm. right? I think one of the uh, biggest things to remember is that every book reveals Jesus, Mm -hmm. right? So uh, he first shows up in Genesis chapter 3 as the seed, the seed that will, uh, the seed of woman that will bruise the serpent's head uh, crush the serpent's head, even though the serpent would bruise his heel. And that ultimately shows up as Jesus. So all throughout, in, in, uh, in the book of Ruth, Boaz shows up as a type of Christ and reveals as a kinsman redeemer. He's even in the book of Job, that book that I used to hate to read, sometimes still struggle to read. Uh, over the last few years, I've gained probably a new understanding, or I'm looking at it in a different, and I, I enjoy reading Job now. But when I was younger, I couldn't wait to get to almost the middle part of the book where Job which this story takes place probably between Genesis 11 and 12. So early on, right, in human history, Mm -hmm. uh, it's probably when the story of Job takes place. And he declares, in the midst of everything he's lost, he says this, I know my Redeemer lives. Mm -hmm. That's prophetic. Jesus showing up in the book of Job somewhere between Genesis 11 and 12. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I'd say look for Jesus in every book. Absolutely. Right? Look for Jesus in every book. So... um, a lot of other great questions that we could talk about. You want to do uh, a little bit more on Genesis as far as different approaches people take towards that? Sure, that's great. That's great. You want to introduce it? Uh, I don't know if I'd introduce it as well as you did <laughs> yesterday when we recorded. Yeah, so what are you talking about specifically? Uh, well, you know, there's people that uh, approach Genesis with different lenses so post enlightenment i think uh a lot of us try to uh, approach genesis with a scientific 
lens and mm. we're trying to make make it answer science questions and i'm just not so sure that genesis is trying to answer those questions you know genesis was written obviously by god but through moses to the israelites who had just come out of egypt they've been in bondage for 400 years all they know, I mean, they've had stories passed down from their father, Abraham, about this God, Yahweh, but mm-hmm. they don't know much about him. They're not in relationship with him. All they know is the gods of the nations around yeah, them in Egypt. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so God brings them out. And yeah, now, they're in a polytheistic culture, right? Right. Many gods, a God for everything. Right. Yeah. And so God brings them out. He's developing a nation. He's teaching them how to be in relationship with him. And he's really trying to teach them who he is and uh, who the creator of the universe is. And so he's not necessarily trying to answer a 21st century question about how many days it took. He's right. just trying to answer big, big questions. Right. right. Yeah, he's not trying to answer every scientific question either. Yeah. Right, so I think in that, are you going to say something? Mm-mm. I think in that, the, the whole question of old earth, young earth, right? Mm. Which one is it? Because science and all their carbon dating, they're coming up with these crazy years. Is it true? I don't know. I'm not a scientist. I don't mm-hmm. know. I know there's creationist. <laughs> that's that's what they would em- embrace. That uh, you know, just refute old Earth theory. I'm not here to take a stand for or against old Earth, for or against young Earth. I will take a firm stance on the creation account as it shows up in Genesis that God created the heavens right. and the earth, brought it all into order. Right. So it's not an essential belief. It's not like, an essential belief. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, some questions came in on Sunday and. and um, they were really, really wondering like what the church stance is, and it's like, well, I don't, I don't know if we have a stance on it's got to be young or it's got to be old because it's not an essential belief. And yeah, yeah, you can have arguments all day long about what you believe, and you're ne- never really going to find an answer. No, never really going to find an answer. I'll, I'll tell you that there are several um, theories regarding creation, regarding the seven days of creation. I'll just talk about them really quick because I think it would benefit the audience to understand what the theories are. Some of them really are established maybe to coincide with scientific discovery. And, uh, and, uh, and so one of them is this idea that it's not seven literal days, uh, that they are representative of a time period. Uh, specifically, people that would adhere to that theory uh, would would quote where the New Testament says, you know, uh, or where the Bible says, uh, a day is as a thousand years to the Lord. And uh, and so they would say that it could be, uh, that a thousand years could be literally, so it could be 7,000 years of creation. It could be that, even even some go as far to say that that thousand years is like a metaphorical number that represents... Just a long time. Just a very, very long time, right? Yeah. Uh, and so uh, could some of that be true? Yes, it is. Personally, where I stand, and I know we might even have differences in this, uh, I, I'm, I would, my problem with that theory is that God kind of defines a day even before the sun, moon, and stars are in place. He says the evening and the morning were the first day, mm-hmm. right? So that's my struggle to embrace that theory. Um, the other theory is that, hey, man, seven days are seven days, and from Genesis 1 all the way through the end of the seventh day, it is seven days. Genesis 1, 1 through there is seven days. God said it. That's the way it is. Science is totally wrong. Here's all the, the problems with carbon dating theory and, you know, uh, whatever. So I would agree, first of all, that Genesis is not written to be a science book. The mm-hmm. Bible's not written to be a science book. It wasn't ri- written to answer that question. It was definitely not yeah. written to answer that question. It was to say, hey, here's how the earth came into being because we have a God that is creator. He's yeah, and big. he's different than all these other and gods. And he's different right. than all these other... Right. That's right, than all, than all the other gods. There's a differentiation uh, between. And, uh, and so then there's another theory that I think is plausible that I don't necessarily have... Uh, uh, up until now, I haven't found a, a hard time with this possibility. And it's called the gap theory. And the gap theory basically asserts that between Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, and Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, that there is a period of time undefined. Introduce that possibility. That would allow for old earth. So let me just, to the best of my ability, quote Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, and, and then, then show you where that gap. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, and the Spirit of God did hover over the face of the waters. That's the end of verse 2, as I remember it from memory. Space. So God had created the heavens and the earth, no form and void. Period of time. 
Genesis 1-3, and then God said, let there be light, and then God began to bring order, mm-hmm. creative order, to that which he had already spoken to existence. Mm-hmm. And he did it by voice, too. So <clears throat> I don't necessarily have a problem with gap theory, and it would allow for, for old earth. Um, I don't fight for one or the other. Here's what I'll fight for. I fight against evolution. I fight for God said and the power of his word brought things into being Absolutely. as Genesis chapter 1 records it. Any stray from that, I have a problem with. Yeah. Mm-hmm. For yeah. sure. Yeah. I know you're open, Alvin, and this is not, I think, a, this is a place where difference is okay. Right. Right? That there's not a problem, mm-hmm. uh, that we're still in alignment, yet there's some difference. I know you... So I, I tend to lean towards more towards one of those two, either like, more of a gap theory or more of uh, a day is a thousand years a thousand years in mm-hmm. the eyes of the Lord um, and I'm totally fine with other people who disagree with that yeah, yeah because I think you can correct me if I'm wrong I don't think there would be any disagreement on this but I think our church's stance is God's word is true we may have different interpretations of what that means but God's word is true yeah yeah and right. so there's room for us to have disagreement on that um, like I have I take a little bit of issue with the literal seven day thing. And somebody else had a response for this. I don't remember what that was. But one of the things I noticed is that the sun doesn't appear, I believe, until the fourth day. Now, we define a day as a 24-hour period (laughs) where the earth is in rotation in relationship to the sun. So if there was no sun until the fourth day, I have a hard time defining a day as a a literal 24-hour period. So that's my thing. And I don't think that God was necessarily, again, trying to answer that question. I think that he's just trying to created an origin story and reveal who he is and man for those of us that like to argue which you know in my past i would like to have argued some of these points a long time <laughs> i think it's some interesting dis- <laughs> <coughs> the fun of live podcast sorry about that uh, i think it's some interesting discussion M- my counter that would be well god defined the evening and the morning were the, the first day right yeah. and okay well whatever here's what we all agree on god said and it was done Absolutely. In whatever span of time it took, God said, and it was done. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Right. And that's the essential thing. That's the essential thing. Mm-hmm. For sure. For sure, yeah. So that's an interesting conversation. Uh, you were talking about uh, God revealing himself and differentiating himself for the children of Israel about who he was. And it reminded me of Exodus because when we, we see just before God brings the children of Israel out of Egypt— that um, he shows himself with a mighty hand uh, to both Israel and to the Egyptians through the plagues, right? Ten Mm -hmm. plagues. What's interesting, if you dive into each one of those plagues, is that God is actually having a showdown, so to speak, with different Egyptian gods. That every one of those plagues was targeted at the God of harvest, right? Right? Uh, was targeted at even Pharaoh's son, who Pharaoh and his firstborn son would have been considered a god, mm. right? So each one of them, I don't have time to break it all down, it's a very interesting study. You, it, it, it can be seen how God is showing himself as the, one the true, Almighty, yeah. the one mm-hmm. true God, right? So then, then, he, then they come out of Egypt, and, and God reveals himself as, Hero Israel, the Lord our God is one. Right? Because what did they just come out of? They came out of a culture where there was a, it was polytheism, multiple gods. Mm-hmm. Right? And he's like, hey, one God that created, same God that spoke to Abraham. Right? And we go right down, same God that, that, that brought the flood, that made a covenant with Noah, that, that, that made a covenant with Abraham, that showed up in, in a burning bush to Moses, that sustained you through 400 years in Egypt, and that now brought you out. One God. Yeah. Right? So he's just revealing himself, which mm-hmm. is really the point of the Bible anyway. Yeah. Not science. Right. Right. Yeah. The Old Testament is important to read because it reveals God. Bottom it shows line. us who God is. And then when we're in the creation account too. A, it shows us who we are. Mm-hmm. And yeah, the, the Old Testament or the New Testament doesn't make sense apart from the Old Testament. Doesn't make sense at all, right? And it's confusing as to why the New Testament would even be good news. Yeah, wh- why, would, why, Jesus, why Jesus would Jesus have to die? Come. Yeah, Jesus makes came and he died, and it's good news. Why is it good news? Yeah, because there's bad news before that. Yeah, because yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mess up time and time again and cannot do it on my own, no matter how hard I try. 
Someone asked a question on Sunday and they're like, why? And it's a, it's a funny one, but they're like, why? Because you look at all the kings of the Old Testament and then Israel and it's like God saves them. He rescues them. They sin again, you know, mm-hmm. and then sometimes it's like God, you know, uses Babylon to correct them. And then they come out of it and they're serving God again and then they sin again. And every king is like, you know, you might have one good one, but then they stumble and then. They're, they're asking the question, like, why does that keep happening? Don't you think they learn from their own history that, like, hey, it's not good to do that? But it's like, hey, all of us are that. We're all that king. You are that man. We are mm-hmm. Israel yeah. that God saves us, and we sin again, and we mess up again, and we can't do it on our own. And that's the entire point. That is the entire point. Yeah. Like, uh, I heard the this quote one time for the question of, why does good things happen? Why does bad things happen to good people? And it's like, there was no, there is no good people. The only good person was Jesus. And he, <laughs> Yeah. And he chose the cross. And he chose the cross. Yeah. So, so the idea of it is like, hey, we we cannot do it without Jesus. Yeah. 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 And that brings up something we talked about, too, that, uh, you know, there's a question, why did God take so long to send Jesus? Well, it's because, mm. number one, he allowed us free will. So we made a decision to live life apart from him and mm. try to figure it out our own way. So as a good father, he's going to let us endure uh, obviously it's not as i his perfect will but he's going to let us have our will and 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 live the life apart from him that we wanted that we chose and it's going to teach us life apart from him is going to teach us oh my goodness we need god we need a savior and then all throughout the old testament you're seeing god's faithfulness through people and he's reaching out and for his humanity. pursuit of humanity yeah, drawing his us love. back yeah, yeah. and promising hey i'm gonna send a savior and the law you talked about this on sunday the law was a tutor that brought us to christ it taught mm-hmm. us our need that we could never measure up we could never be good enough yeah. again yeah. christ would make no sense if something didn't teach us yeah. that right. he was necessary mm-hmm. yeah so when you read that story, I mean, over and over, it just makes the New Testament, like you said, so much more powerful, so much more fulfilling. Yeah. Right. hundred percent. Yeah. So uh, uh, some great questions came in, and we discussed uh, that it would be good to talk about some of these things. <clears throat> the Old Testament reveals so many laws, right? So how do we know what ones we're supposed, still supposed to pay attention to today? You ever wonder that? Mm-hmm. So... Uh, Pull up, pull up your sleeve there. I mean, that's one of them right there. I don't know if they can right. see that or not. I'm going to hell. Yeah, why? Oh, my <laughs> There's a tattoo. We don't claim that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Someone's going to get upset about that. I'm kidding. Yes. No, you're not going to hell. Uh, and when I was growing up, man, tattoos were a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if that was ever taught. That was for sure my... I don't know if you guys ever called. said it, but I remember some kid in our youth group, and I wasn't in youth group yet, but I like looked up to him, and they got a tattoo, and like, it was it was kind of like, oh no, this kid's like gone off the deep end. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> might have been, you know, I don't know. Um, the that's that's interesting. Why and, and why do they even come up? Because the Bible says, hey, don't take any markings, right? It says that in Leviticus. Don't take ta- uses the word tattoos one version, mm-hmm. right, on yourself, uh, and so. Obviously, let's remember this, that this people group that started as a family that multiplied greatly in Egypt is coming out to go into a land where they're going to be a nation, and they don't know how to be a nation because the only example they ever had was Egypt. Mm -hmm. But they're going to be God's people and his nation. So God, in his grace and mercy, says, I'm going to show them how to become a people. I'm going to show them how to be my people, so I'm going to show them how to relate to me. I'm going to show them how to be a nation. So we're going to give some laws that are governed how they are with one another. And I'm going to give them some laws that govern how they treat the world around them. That's basically what the covenant is that he mediates or that that Moses mediates between God and his people called the nation of Israel. So within it, the customs and cultures of the day, the markings that people would take in the tattoos were all about typically the gods that they would serve or other pagan rituals yeah right so that was the culture of the day that was the culture of the day and we're talking about in the old testament ladies and gentlemen right so god says don't do it either the same verse or the very next verse god also said don't trim your sideburns so we're all in trouble so now we're all in trouble (laughs) we're all going to hell (laughs) (laughs) if that's the case right well that's why we still have hasidic jews to this day that they've got the long curls right here because they've taken it literally uh uh, bryce are you going to do that now (laughs) (laughs) sorry we got somebody behind the camera we're just giving him a hard time so um 
so yeah, the uh, the reality is is that those things don't pass through the new covenant, mm-hmm. right? So how do we know which things pass through the new covenant, which which things don't? And I think that is a great question. Uh, let, let's let's just talk a little bit more. There were a whole lot of other laws that God gave them. I mean, because they were traveling, they were going through the wilderness. God gave them a law and showed them how to build a dig a latrine outside the camp. Mm-hmm. Like when you got to go to the bathroom, here's what you do. I mean, he covered all kind of things, right? Right. Uh, we were not building a latrine outside the camp in 2024, mm-hmm. right? Um, so, I mean, the other thing, I mean, there were only, you know, there's certain times that governed when you could have sexual relationships with your spouse. I mean, it covered everything. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so, which, which make it through? And um, I think there's uh, there is some great questions, a great question to ask yourself uh, when you're trying to figure figure that out, and here it is: Has the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ in any way affected, changed, or abolished the Old Testament law in question? I'm gonna say that one more time because it was kind of my fault. Has the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus in any way affected, or changed, or abolished the Old Testament law in question? So, one of the first ones they come to in the New Testament, we're trying to figure out circumcision. What do we do with all these Gentiles? Do they need to be circumcised? Right? They have this huge council at Jerusalem. All the apostles draw together. We got a problem. These people that aren't Israelites are coming to faith. They're coming to Jesus. They're having an encounter with God. We know that because they're being filled with the Holy Spirit and there's evidence in their life. What are we going to require of them? They had a very small list of things they required of them. Yeah. And very none s- of them had to do with circumcision. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> they, they didn't need to be circumcised. Mm-hmm. Matter of fact, the Bible. New Testament explicitly says that's not necessary. Um, so, so what about the dietary laws? They didn't make them. Yeah, Peter says. Right. God gave him a, a vision. Oh uh, yeah, I bet. What? Thank God for the vision of bacon. Now that vision <laughs> wasn't about bacon, yeah. right? And at the same time, God was letting them know that vision was about. Hey, listen, Cornelius, this Gentile, go to him, mm-hmm. even though he might be considered unclean under the Old Testament. There's a new order in, in right. place, right? So this vision is of this pig coming down, prepared, and God tells Peter to kill and eat. I would never do that. That's not allowed under the Old Testament. Uh, there's no evidence in the New Testament that the apostles required the, um, the Gentile believers to adhere to the dietary laws. Uh, however, the moral, the moral laws of the Ten Commandments... Still there. Still mm-hmm. valid. Still valid, right? A faith from the Abrahamic covenant? I mean, that was a foreshadowing of our kind of faith. Right. So, so, so it makes it through. Does it make it through? Uh, I can't see where uh, there is still an abolishment on tattoos. If there was, then we would have to grow out our sideburns and a whole lot of other things that are listed there in Leviticus. So mm-hmm. sometimes we like to make man likes to make laws out of things that are uncomfortable for us or we just don't like. Mm-hmm. It's not our preference, right. and, and that can be a danger. Mm-hmm. And it's easy to find scriptures to back up what our preference is, by the way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So then the next and really important question is, are you going to get a tattoo? Am I going to get a tattoo? <laughs> <laughs> well, if I said no, then that might sound as an absolute. I will say I have no intention or plan at the current time to get a tattoo. Why well, so is maybe. that a father-son bonding so experience maybe. you want us to have? I'm down. You're down. I'm, I'm down. Not, not at this point. <laughs> not interested. Do a little shamrock on the ankle or something. I don't know. Shamrock? Um, that's a joke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't there probably some demonic like thing about a shamrock? Oh, probably. actually, you yeah, you're probably right. Celtic probably origin, is. yeah. Celtic origin, yeah. That's just crazy. crazy. Yeah, because then if people are gonna, if people are going to, um, where are we going? With even this? allow tattoos, they'll make up certain rules about what tattoos you can and can't get. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of... I would say if you're getting a tattoo with the intention of it being demonic or the intention of it right. worshiping another god, that's 100% sinful. Yeah, For yeah, sure. It, it, here's probably where it's probably good to like draw this part of this discussion to a conclusion. Here's the thing. Old Testament law, Old Covenant, written on tablets and on stone. Mm-hmm. New Covenant is written on our hearts. So the reality is, under the New Covenant... 
It's not whether, oh, is this Old Testament law? It's really, I recognize there's things for me that are sin because God's convicted me of them in my personal walk and what he's called me to that for somebody else is not. Right. But it is for me. And it might not even be show up in Scripture anywhere. Mm-hmm. But, but the Lord's convicted me of mm-hmm. that. Yeah, Good. Paul talked about uh, for some people, they don't have a guilty conscience when they eat meat sacrificed Sacrifice to idols. idols. But for others, it would cause them to stumble. That would be demonic. Yeah. You're opening up your life to demonic influence. Paul says, not really. Yeah. But if it causes you to stumble, I won't do it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Really good. Way to bring us out of the tattoo conversation. Yeah. Good answer. <laughs> Could you talk a little bit more about, you touched on this Sunday, but uh, the difference between described and prescribed in the Old Testament? Oh, yeah. So, okay. So, uh, the um, yeah, we, we talked about things that show up in Scripture. Uh because people are like, described and prescribed. He never used that language. No, I didn't, yeah. but that's the conversation or sometimes the theological discussion about what shows up in Scripture. Basically, I just said this, that not everything that shows up in Scripture is God giving approval for it. It's just telling us the story of what happened. And, and particularly, I was talking about the story of Abraham taking Hagar to produce offspring, that in the culture of the day, that was the norm. And it would have been said it was Abraham and Sarah's because Hagar was Sarah's servant, basically, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, um, And so that showing up, and even some other things, uh, some deceitful things that took place, is not like God saying it's okay. It's just this is what happened, describing what happened. And I love that the Bible's honest about the heroes, you know, like mm-hmm. it shows, it doesn't show just their highlights. It shows their flaws. Yeah, their I probably, failures. if I was God, I probably wouldn't have put the story of David and Bathsheba in there. Right. Doesn't look good for a man after God's own heart, right? Yeah, right, for sure. This God's economy is different. Yeah, and He's not afraid of our criticism. He's not. He's not afraid of our mistakes, <laughs> right. of our junk either, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 And yeah. just because you're getting blessed in a certain area doesn't mean you're doing everything right. Ooh. Because, first of all, God's long-suffering anyways. Yeah. So it doesn't necessarily prove your character or, you know. But. Exactly. So good. So good. You guys, uh, you know, one thing I like about these two guys right here, young, 28? 27. 27 and 26, these guys have a passion for the truth of God's Word. They have a passion to rightly divide the Word of truth. Uh, I'm not just saying that because they're on my team because one of them my son but is what I've observed. And not only that, they have an incredible, you guys have an, both have an incredible ability to communicate the Word of God. And your, your passion to do it correctly and to rightly divide, I'm incredibly proud of and glad that you're on my team. So I'd say that. Thank you. And we have really nice hats, too. You do have nice hats. Yeah. Representing Miracle Life God, Music. Life Music. Shout out to Miracle God, available on all platforms. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah, so the, uh, the, the, the Old Testament kind of ends randomly. It's not like a, the end. It just kind of ends. And uh, the interesting thing is what happens uh, between Malachi mm-hmm. and Jesus coming on the scene. Right. And it's known as 400 silent years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one thing that I think is really significant that's really cool about that is uh, how about the Israelites are in bondage to the uh, the Egyptians uh, for 400 years. Mm -hmm. And then God sends a deliverer to rescue them and to lead them out Mm -hmm. into a new nation. And then 400 years of silence. People don't realize they're bound in their sin. Even the Jewish people who think, mm-hmm. oh, we have the law. You know, we yeah. got it. we're better than everybody else. Yeah. They don't realize they're being bondage to sin. Mm-hmm. And Jesus, the deliverer, comes. Comes up after 400 yeah, years. Yeah, after 400 years and delivers all humanity from sin and its grip. So good. Yeah. So awesome. Yeah. Just the types and the shadows, how you can see them all pointing to Jesus. All pointing to Jesus. And the, the reason they call it, 400 silent years is because there was no widespread revelation of God. We've got really no recordings of, uh, uh, of a lot of prophets. I mean, during that time, we do have the writing of some of the Apocrypha. Mm-hmm. If I'm not mistaken in my time frame, and I'm willing to be wrong, and I, I might be, but I believe actually First and Second Maccabees, which shows up in the Apocrypha, mm-hmm. uh, was written during that time. That's the period of the Maccabean Revolt. Mm-hmm. 
that shows up in history. Um, but there's really no widespread revelation or prophet speaking for God and declaring God. It's just silent. And when we, which is just fits into right the theme that God's given Life Church for this year is listen up, right? When we don't listen up and we don't have the revelation of the Word of God, when God's not speaking or people aren't paying attention, why does God not speak? It's not that He's not speaking, it's that people aren't paying attention, mm-hmm. right? And when people don't pay attention, what do we do? We, we do our own things mm-hmm. in our own way. Mm-hmm. So during this 400 years, something like, I don't remember the number. I want to say it's astronomical, like over a thousand new laws were added to the law God had given Moses. Mm-hmm man-made stuff, right? That's when we have the emergence of Pharisees, Sadducees, different sects, S-E-C-T-S, right? Mm-hmm. I always say that. And That's like, a hard one to say. Yeah, yeah, right? <laughs> I want to be, be clear. Yeah. yeah, I want to be clear. Uh, uh, when they emerge, and so then Jesus comes on the scene, when he starts railing against religion and tradition and laws, he's not railing against the law of Moses. <laughs> He's not railing against the covenant that God gave through Moses because that's good. Matter of fact, Paul reveals that it was full of glory, Mm -hmm. right? It was a glorious covenant. He's railing against all this man-made stuff because man had stopped listening. And when man stops listening, God's like, okay, I'm going to speak again, but we're just going to let you go in your way. And that's what happened. Mm Mm-hmm. What I think is so cool is in Hebrews, he says, uh, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. By his son. And so, you know, everybody's wondering where God's at. And uh, talk about people trying to do things in their own power. A lot of historians say that during the time leading up to Jesus' arrival, there was, like you talk about, the Maccabean revolts. There's all of these revolts happening, all these... uh, Antichrists trying to rise up and deliver the people of Israel, and they're all trying to make it happen in their own power, mm-hmm. and they're all trying to make it work because they're like, where's God at? And uh, one thing I think is so cool is that in this time where everybody, it seems like God is silent, they don't realize God's actually working, and mm-hmm. he's about to do something greater than they could ever try to attempt in their own power. Uh, like the song says, even when I don't see it. He's working. That's right. Should we end with a salvation call? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Well, that's uh, the Old Testament. I mean, we could talk for weeks. There's right. whole Bible classes, uh, classes in seminary that go on for a long time on the Old Testament, but we just want to give an overview for people. And this Sunday, we're going to dive into the New Testament, which means next podcast, we're going to dive deeper into whatever we talk about on Sunday. And I'm probably actually going to pick up Sunday right here in this whole silent Uh, 400 silent years Mm. and that'll be the introduction into the new testament as well so thanks for joining us for the mic up podcast episode number two like the podcast give us your comments give us some feedback we'd love to hear from you that's it guys that's a wrap my first time ever on a podcast let's go dude (laughs)